All right, I'm going to go ahead and start. Uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce our very own Dave Mosipus. Uh, I'm going to keep my <coughs> comments brief to maximize Dave's time. Uh, so Dave is a professor in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology and a member of the Center for Immunology. And the Cancer Center is lucky that he's shifted or he's included um, tumor immunology as part of one of the areas that he's studying. And the reason that we're lucky is that Dave's work in other areas of immunology has been transformative. He's published regularly in Cell Science, Nature, Nature Immunology, Immunity, and he's a frequent um, speaker on the, on the speaker circuit, and you'll hear why in a minute. But really, Dave has got a way of looking at an issue in a unique way and bringing new ideas to the field that many other people follow. So, and you'll hear more about that. Dave got his PhD at UConn with Leo Le Francois and then did a postdoc with Rafi Ahmed before coming here in what year? 07. 07. And he quickly rose through the ranks to become a full professor. So um, when I was looking online last night about Dave, I came across an interesting picture from him um, from UConn, and I wanted to just show that to you now. So I, I didn't realize that Dave was a tuba player and had his own polka band. Well, you can see that he was at the annual Czech Festival in downtown Yukon. So I guess this is what he was doing when he was a graduate student. Um, and when I asked Dave yesterday if he wanted me to say anything about him today, he said to tell everybody that he got a trophy for fishing. Um, I think it was a participatory trophy rather than <laughs> anything else, but, but we'll go from there. So with that, um, here's Dave. Thanks, Dave. Can everyone hear me? So thanks for the opportunity to speak. Uh, it was a couple of years ago that uh, you had invited me and really just to talk about some of our T cell memory work related to uh, infection. And I proposed sort of an idea, very speculative, about how we might apply some of these lessons to tumor immunotherapy. And so today I was going to present uh, really where we've gone in that direction in the last couple of years, uh, highlighting the work of a postdoc in the lab, uh, Pam Rosado. And I'll begin that with just uh, a little bit of a background on something called resident memory T cells to put this in context and really highlighting the, the genesis of these ideas. And then I'm going to end with uh, some work that I'm very passionate about. Um, it's not something that I really present uh, very often. In fact, what I'll present is a little bit sort of crude and informative, but I think it might have some relevance to those who are thinking about adoptive cell therapies. So. Uh, but I'll briefly just uh, put this work into context by highlighting the dynamics of an adaptive immune response. I think we all know that, um, that the abundance of naive T cells, uh, specific for an antigen you haven't yet seen, of course, are vanishingly rare. Now, in the event that cognate antigen is recognized in a productive way, these rare T cells are really going to undergo a massive amount of proliferation. In a mouse, probably at least 20 cell divisions within a very short period of time. And that division rate's been clocked at about six hours, something that cell biologists almost have a hard time believing when you tell them that. And that results in an amplification of the response, so these cells are, are numerically relevant. And that is coupled with differentiation. So there's a lot going on here. These cells are acquiring effector functions to, to allow them to deal with, in this case, the infection at hand. Now, after going through that intense rounds of proliferation, and hopefully the pathogen's been cleared in that time, we lose most of that population. So these cells, many of them die during this expansion process. However, a fraction don't. They survive. They resume sort of a resting state. And that has resulted in amplification of the total pool in terms of quantity. And that's what we call an immunological memory. But there's also a lot of anatomic changes at the population level associated with a productive immune response. So those naive T cells, well, you only have a handful specific for a foreign antigen. So they're not attempting to scan the entire body. Rather, they limit their surveillance to secondary lymphoid organs, such as uh, lymph nodes there in purple. And they're doing so through a biased program of recirculation. So using lymphatics in blood as conduits to migrate amongst the different lymph nodes, or the white pulp of the spleen. And so if you have an infection, which I've drawn here in the big toe, the issue is these cells have to wait for the antigen to come to them. Uh, however, that will trigger this program of proliferation differentiation, and then this coupled with migration. So now these cells migrate out more broadly to the body, 
That's important because I'm going to be focusing on CDA T cells. T cells, of course, are, are tactile. Their job is to scan the surface of host cells and ask, okay, are you harboring my antigen or my intracellular infection? So they have to go to where the antigen is, and they have to look broadly to be able to find those cells. What's key for today's talk is that after the resolution of this response, that amplified population of memory cells that remains is now more broadly distributed than the naive counterparts. So yes, they're in lymph nodes or blood, but you can also isolate them from the rest of the body, from what are called non-lymphoid tissues. And these would be solid organs or barrier sites, such as skin, skin epithelia or, or, or mucosal epithelia. And the field you know, likes to subset T cells in, in, into different lineages. And they do so in part based on the migration properties of the cells or, or the tissues that they're patrolling, and then our models for how they would participate in the event of reinfection. And so if you have cells out here at the front lines, and you have a local reinfection at that barrier surface, these cells would be positioned sort of for more, more immediate recognition of that infection. And transcriptionally or phenotypically, they seem poised, these cells that control the front lines, for more rapid execution of effector functions. And a number of studies from, from us, but really from the, the field at large, have shown that these frontline cells can actually greatly accelerate protection or can control infections out here at the front lines. But if that mechanism isn't in place or is not sufficient in the context of, of this particular recall infection, then antigen that drains into the deeper recesses of the body, in this case the, the draining secondary lymphoid organs, well, these tissues are patrolled by different populations of T cells. And that would include central memory T cells, which you may have heard of, or TCM. And these cells are poised, in the event of antigen recognition, to sort of recapitulate that primary immune response a little bit faster, a little bit more efficiently, because there's more TCM than there were naive cells. But they proliferate, they differentiate to effectors, and they migrate where they're needed. And so, the, the, the general paradigm for some time that really sort of dominated, I think, uh, the thinking was that the surveillance uh, of the host was really accomplished by recirculation. And I mentioned that in terms of naive cells. They go into a lymph node from the blood, they look around, they leave the lymph node, they go to another lymph node. And so the thinking was that memory cells were serving SLOs in the same way, and different populations of memory cells were serving non-lymphoid tissues but again doing so by a program of recirculation. And implicit in this model is a, a few things. One is that you could capture immunosurveillance simply by looking in blood. The other issue is if, you know, let's say you had a tumor out there in a non lymphoid tissue, well those memory cells or those antigen experience cells that you have that are contained within blood that might recognize that tumor, well they would be, th that, that tumor would be very permissive to immunosurveillance in the steady state or during homeostasis. And so I want to bring up an issue that is now widely accepted, and that's one of resident memory with the non lymphoid tissues. And it suggests that the, the rules here I just described really don't capture much of what's going on, although it's a complicated and it's an evolving story. But so here, ah, thanks very much. Um, we're interrogating the migration properties of a memory population. And uh, so here on the right, we have a mouse that uh, has been immunized with an acute viral infection, LCMV, lymphocytic chorea meningitis virus. Not important for our purposes, other than the fact this virus is clear within about a week. But it results in the establishment of memory cells in SLOs, in blood, and in the, the 20 non lymphoid tissues we've looked in. On the left, we have a naive mouse that lacks those memory cells. We're conjoining the vasculature here using this technique of parabiosis, so these might share a blood supply. And so this is a test of recirculation. So if you had a cell, the example I use is a spleen, if you were to leave that spleen, use blood as a conduit to migrate back into that spleen, effectively you're going to equilibrate between the spleens of these two mice, again, because they share that blood supply. And so that's what happens uh, if we look here on the left. This was our immune parabiont. It used to have twice as many memory CDA T cells but they've equilibrated with a naive parabiont because those cells are largely in recirculation. But if we look on the right, we're in the female reproductive tract of a mouse, and there you're not witnessing that equilibration. And so what this is indicating is that those cells were, became parked within the tissue, or something what we'd refer to as being resident. And if you sort of look more broadly throughout the organism, we're plotting the 
portion that are resident here, if you look in non-lymphoid tissues, effectively resonates. This mechanism is dominating immune surveillance of this compartment. So our cells in the small intestine, whether you're in the epithelium or the underlying lamina propria, are essentially parked within that tissue. You are not going to find them in blood. And that's true or mostly true in most non-lymphoid compartments. It's different in secondary lymphoid organs where you have is more dominated by recirculation. That depends on context. That's a story uh, for another day. Um, but the basic model, basic model is this, that when you have a primary immune response that is initiated with an SLO such as lymph node, those rare naive T cells are going to proliferate extensively to become numerically relevant. And a fraction of those daughter cells that migrate out into a non-lymphoid compartment, say the intestinal mucosa, they're going to undergo an in situ differentiation program, post-migration, where they're going to become parked within the tissue, or what we refer to as being resident. And now the, the term that has been coined to describe these cells are TRM, or T resident memory, to really indicate that this is a, a discrete lineage or flavor of T cell, uh, because transcriptionally, they look different than what you're going to find in blood. Functionally, they look different than what you're going to find in blood. The markers are very poor in the field. Uh, often they're, they consistently express something called CD69, and occasionally they express a CD103, and that depends on where that cell really is and what its simulation history has been. But the important feature here I want to just uh, reemphasize is that this is a separate pool. This flavor of cell is not going to be, you, know, you can't sample it in blood. You would have to look in the tissue. And this raises important issues about immunosurveillance. You know, when you have cells that are relevant within the blood that are in the resting state, you know, there are many tissues in the body that aren't constitutively sort of available or permissive to immune surveillance. A couple other really quick points here. These cells are changing their phenotype post-migration. And so one way of looking at, at it is that they're adapting to their unique microenvironment. And so I, I pointed out CD69 and CD103 before. These are just two markers. This is the gut epithelium. If you look very early during a response in mouse, uh, these cells come in, CD69, CD103 negative, just like what you would see in, in blood or spleen. But they make adaptations post-migration. They're upregulating these molecules within the tissue. And if you wait you know, 30 days, that differentiation program is complete. So, so the idea here, and this, this is uh, work from our lab, but really the field at large, and this is work that, that has a long way to go to sort of complete this picture. So it's somewhat speculative, but again, post-migration, each tissue has local developmental cues that are going to shape the T-cell differentiation program. This obviously ha has relevance for when you get into studying T-cell biology within tumor microenvironments. All right. So I look at this the function of, of residents and why the immune system is perhaps built this way is, it, is it, it does provide a mechanism for biasing your immunosurveillance. And so in the context of an infection, if you were to have had a, a, a big toe infection, maybe a left big toe infection, you could dominate sort of the, the number of memory cells that are scanning that area, and you would do so by parking more cells there. So you don't have to sort of come up with a big toe-specific recirculation program. And I think this is the mechanism that dominates certainly a primary response after infection. And that would be work from, from our lab, but really dozens of other labs, uh, I think, at this point have, uh, would, would confirm that, that observation. Um, so we've been interested in, in the function of these cells, the motility, what they do. And so this is intravital microscopy. This is the uterus of a living mouse. These green cells are specific for a virus and viral infection that's been cleared. And even though they are resident within the tissue, you know, they're, they're modal. So they're scanning the surface of a host cell, looking for evidence of reinfection in perpetuity. And so the question that we were going to ask is what happens when these cells at the front lines recognize their cognate antigen? And so we're doing so in the female reproductive tract in the context of infection by delivering a recall virus that's going to stimulate these pre-existing established TRM, or we're going to do so by just taking a peptide from the virus. This is really important for the, when we get into the tumor immunology. So these cells essentially have, have been licensed 
so that they don't necessarily have to see their antigen for all the biology I'm going to talk about today in the context of an, a real infectious setting. They had the infection in the past. They had the danger in the past. It necessitated the induction of this response. Now if they see their cognate peptide, they are going to do the things that I'm about to tell you. And, and what happens is within 48 hours, you see a whole lot of cells within this tissue. So there's a very rapid accumulation of CD8 T cells within this compartment. And I'm just going to summarize in cartoon form some of the biology relevant to today's talk that's ongoing. This was work of a previous graduate student, Jason Schengel, in the lab who's since moved on. So the idea here is you have resident memory. It's parked within the tissue. You have other cells that aren't participating in immunosurveillance at this front line. So if you have an infection breakout, well, initially, this is the only game in town in terms of being that very first rapid responder at that frontline portal. But if you have a recognition event, you know, what we found is that these cells broadcast that information. So they say, hey, I've, I've seen this before. I know it was in the context of danger. So if I see it again, I'm going to tell my neighbors. And they do so in part by secreting cytokines, by inducing a chemokine response, by inducing changes in the vascular endothelium that essentially changes the migration rules of this compartment, at least transiently, and allows those antigen-experienced CDA T cells that are circulating and passing by in the blood to now enter the tissue. And this, there really is no apparent specificity in the recruitment for cells of, of just the, you know, the, the relevant specificity for this infection. So you basically pull everyone in. I don't think there could be a mechanism for selecting specificity. I think this is a way of just accelerating uh, immunosurveillance very quickly. This is that initial rapid response. Now, if this doesn't contain the infection, you know, I'm assuming some of these cells will be relevant and going to be helpful. But if, 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 if the infection is not contained, the antigen gets out, you know, via dendritic cells or, or the virus, down the, you know, the lymphatics into the draining lymph node over here, sure, you're going to initiate uh, the classic recall response you see in the textbook where cells proliferate, my, you know, differentiate, migrate. But, but that takes time. And that, that's not going to be as quick as this sort of early phase of the response. So it's not just CD8 T cells that are being recruited when local CD8 positive TRM are, are reactivated. To, to our great surprise, you're recruiting B cells very rapidly. You're activating dendritic cells. I did that again, on, always on a PC. It's CD80. Uh, it's CD86. So, so DCs in the local neighborhood are being told that there's a, an infection in the area. Even if you do this with just a peptide, uh, they're being told by the CD8 T cell, and they're getting ready to sort of initiate immune responses. And then NK cells are upregulating granzyme B. So the whole idea here is this, that when you have a CD8 T cell positioned at the front lines and it sees this cognate antigen, it, it broadcasts that information, which helps prime or stimulate innate immune cells within the environment, and it helps recruit players of the adaptive immune system. Work we haven't yet published is it also induces transudation of antibodies from the serum to that site. So the whole idea is it triggers an immunostimulatory environment. And you can do that. You can mimic, you can trick the tissue into thinking there's a reinfection simply with a peptide. And so the, the simple idea here was to ask whether you could trick a tumor into thinking it's undergoing a reinfection. And could you do so by leveraging the memories that you already have? So we've all experienced a number of viral infections in our life. I could guess what you've had, because some of them are fairly ubiquitous. And because those pathogens, like CUV or EBV or flu, are very well studied, you know, I probably know what peptides that you are responding to from those viruses. And that would depend, of course, on your MHC haplotype. So the idea here is, can we leverage the memories you have to tap into this function with a simple peptide to do something about changing the, the microenvironment within the tumor to one that is more immunostimulatory. So the, to, to have precedent for this, we had to start looking in human tumors. And so we were very lucky to work with Melissa Geller uh, and with BioNet, who have been incredibly helpful. And so we screened blood from patients that are coming in to get their tumors resected. And we just made four tetramers. Uh, two to EBV, one to CMV, one to flu. Uh, and we made them to HLA-2 because about half of Minnesotans are, are, have that haplotype. And 
pretty much 100% of people have experienced at least one of those infections and have a memory to it. And you can see that here in blood, in the box. Those are those, those pathogen-specific or tetramer-positive responses. And then if you look in their tumor, as long as you can get enough CD8s out to analyze, and that is true in the majority of our cases, those, those tumors contain the populations as well, specific for the virus. So those TILs that you're seeing aren't all tumor-specific. T cells, these, these cells are surveying your body, and a tumor is part of your body, and those are coming under this surveillance as well by the sort of antiviral CD8 T cell population. And if you look at the, the phenotype of these cells, you know, I don't know if it's too relevant for the story, but you know, in blood, in red, you know, these cells wouldn't express CD69 or CD103. However, in the tumor, many of them are 69 positive, some are CD103 positive. This, in a way, is the expectation and a clear indication we're not looking at blood contaminants here. So this is a population that is, 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 is unique in terms of its phenotype and its position within that tumor microenvironment. And not to belabor the point here, uh, but, but Pam has, has looked at a lot of tumors at this point, and if you look at the abundance collectively in blood, how many, what proportion of your CDH would be specific for flu, EBV, or CMV, you're going to see actually a higher abundance in the tumors. And again, maybe I'm not surprised because these tumors aren't going to have naive T cells, but a lot of those TILs are potentially pathogen specific. That's, that's the data that we have. And so, Again, uh, the whole question here is can we, can we leverage these? Can we use the T cells almost as an adjuvant because they have this broad range of biological functions, probably some of which we have not yet defined, but they can be unlocked with a simple peptide that, again, tricks the T cell into thinking that there's a viral reinfection that's been experienced before in that tumor microenvironment and then to trigger activation of the innate immune system and recruitment of the adaptive immune system. And, and would any of that be helpful in terms of altering the tumor immunosuppressive environment, perhaps attracting CAR T cells to a particular location, a solid tumor? Would this synergize with other therapies, including checkpoint blockade antibody, or maybe just most importantly promote any facets of uh, anti-tumor immunity? So to get at those questions, we had to go to mice and uh, mouse tumor models with, with their you know, inherent limitations. And so I'll try to make this simple. What we've done here, we've done this in a few different ways, but we have established uh, an antiviral memory in mice by giving them something called vesicular stomatitis virus, and not too relevant, but an acute viral infection that's cleared that, as a graduate student I'd found, had resulted in the establishment of memory cells essentially through, throughout the body. And we're waiting for that memory to establish. The virus has gone away, and then we're exposing these mice, or we're, we're we're either transplanting a B16 melanoma or we're using this sort of tamoxifen inducible system in P10-BUF mice, so a genetic model, but where you're generating uh, tumors within the skin. And I should mention that in, in work from Lily Buras published a, a couple of nice papers in the last uh, month uh, looking at facets of resident memory, and he's done so in the skin and all the rules I was talking about in the phenotype reproductive tract sort of are recapitulated within the skin as well. So the question here is if we establish a memory to a virus and then later that mouse has a tumor, would some of those memory cells be integrated within the tumor? And that's what we found. So these red dots here are, are virus-specific CDT cells. They're not recognizing the tumor, but they are contained within the tumor. And then the question is, can we come in with the viral peptide that has nothing to do with the tumor, and would, would that do anything? Could you reactivate those T cells? So again, we've established a memory, we give a tumor, and now we're just injecting a peptide into that tumor microenvironment. And if we look at our, our virus-specific T cells that would now be re-stimulated with that peptide, just because they're in a tumor doesn't mean that they can't make some interferon gamma and some granzyme B. So they've been reactivated. And if we look at the consequences of that reactivation, so I'm sort of calling this bystander CD8 T cells for lack of a better word. So you're recruiting CD8 T cells to that tumor microenvironment. We're excluding the ones that would be specific for this virus. So other CD8s are coming in. You know, we don't know whether any of them would be tumor specific or whether they would be specific for you know, other microbial uh, 
experiences in the past. But they're migrating in, and NK cells are also increasing in number. And these cells, uh, or at least some of them, are upregulating things like granzyme B, part of the cytolytic machinery that would indicate that these cells are maybe getting prepared to, to go to work, like I said before. So again, you know, NK cells are expressing much higher levels of, of granzyme B if you've had local T cell reactivation. And then if you look at dendritic cells, basically you're seeing uh, an increase in the activation of DCs and an increase in the number of DCs that have a migratory phenotype, specifically within the granulinous node. Uh, and these are, are express activation markers as well. So we, we suspect they're probably coming from the tumor, but we haven't actually tested that specifically. If they were and they were in an activated you know, state, the hope would be that they would be carrying some tumor antigens uh, maybe with them that might help educate the immune response. But again, that's speculative. And if we just look more broadly, so here we're doing RNA-seq. This is literally just nine hours after the introduction of that peptide. Here's a volcano plot. And what you might be able to appreciate, or maybe it's data overload, but there's a lot of, of genes being expressed that are associated with sort of immune stimulation. So a lot of chemokines that can induce recruitment, uh, cytokines, such as you know, endocrine gamma here, and then, you know, machinery associated with antigen processing and presentation. So TAP, uh, beta-2M is coming up, and just sort of pilot experiment if you just stain for MHC class 1 on these sort of B16 melanomas, which is, and it's a low class 1 expressor, but it, it looks like it is induced uh, quickly and to a much higher level as a consequence of antiviral CD8 T cell activation. And so the, the critical question is, you know, would any of this have relevance for tumor growth? So in this experiment, all we're doing is inoculating the peptide. In, in this case, in, in, in sort of on, in, at two intervals, 48 hours apart, we're doing so in a B16 melanoma that's palpable. And we've done this in the P10B rat system as well. And we've used, uh, I won't go into all the details, but uh, so here's your tumor. Here's your control in black. It's a rapidly growing tumor. If you give peptide, then you've blunted that growth kinetics. Blunted it, but clearly not, no mice have cleared this tumor. And so you haven't rescued any of the mice. You've just prolonged uh, the inevitable. Now, the question is if you were to, to, to incorporate other immunotherapies, and the only thing we've tried is anti pd one uh, to date. So we're giving, we're, the, the tumor is palpable. We're giving peptide twice to stimulate the antiviral T cells. And then we're coupling this with three shots of anti pd one And if you just gave the anti pd one alone here, you know, this tumor is not particularly permissive. Uh, so you don't, you don't change the, the growth kinetics very much or prolong the survival. If you give peptide alone, you, know, you get an efficacy signal, but again, uh, not ultimately curative. If you were to combine these two things together, then the results look a little better. So here, you know, we haven't cleared all the tumors from every mouse. So some of these mice have been, the, have been culled out uh, because the tumor's gotten too big and the mice had to be sacked. Uh, and you can sort of see that here. But, but about a third of the mice are, are being poised to eliminate this rapidly growing B16 melanoma, which is, a, which is a hard tumor to reject. And if you were to come back and uh, uh, you know, a couple of months later and inoculate that mouse again at a different site with this B16 melanoma, and you aren't providing any therapy at that time. You know, most mice that, that had been cured will reject that tumor. So this would be suggestive that some sort of systemic anti-tumor immunity has been established uh, through, through this process. All right. So th the summary thus far is that we're using antiviral peptides here that, that would be common. So they're not tumor antigens. It wouldn't be personalized medicine per se, other than the fact that we would have to leverage the memories that you've already had, and that would require some sort of blood screening. But those peptides would be fairly sort of ubiquitous. Uh, many of us are responding to the same you know, peptides from scenic CMV or EBV. Uh, we're not using an adjuvant here. We're not vaccinating. Uh, we could vaccinate, or you could use an oncolytic virus, or maybe you could combine this with a radiation or other sort of uh, ideas, but, but we've just uh, started small here. But it promotes an immunostimulatory environment. It synergizes at least with anti pd one to promote tumor clearance, and then in this model, uh, systemic sort of anti-tumor immunity appears to have been established. 
So, you know, one of the major questions here is can we recapitulate this in humans? And so I sadly I don't have a complete answer for you. I'll tell you what, what we do have. And this is uh, preliminary. Uh, in five to seven weeks, we'll have more sequencing, and it won't be preliminary. But I, but I think the evidence is, is strong. So the idea here is we're screening blood. Patient has tetramer positive cells specific for TMV, EBV, or flu, and you identify which ones. Let's say in this person with TMV and EBV, uh, we have the peptides that that person would recognize. And if you take the tumor explant, put it in a petri dish and dump those peptides on it, and then basically just do RNA-seq nine hours later. And so and we're using our mouse as a sort of comparison. So these are the pathways here. This was a, a mouse, a living mouse, where you put the peptide into the tumor in the left column. And so you're seeing what pathways are up or down regulated. If you take that uh, a mouse tumor and put it in a petri dish and add the peptides that reactivate the antiviral T cells within the tumor, it looks fairly similar. And now, if you take the human tumor explant, again, you're seeing sort of a very similar signature. So I think that this gives me, you know, a little more confidence that you can recapitulate some of these same pathways. Some of the same bi biology is operating in a human as what we're seeing in mice. And again, we're in the process of, of looking at uh, more human samples. So the questions going forward here. You know, uh, we, we've talked with, with Chris a lot and, and Bruce in terms of whether we might be able to uh, attract CAR T cells. Uh, and that's, you know, work once we, we broaden our tumor models we, we hope uh, to get into. Whether this would synergize with other therapies, therapies besides anti pd one one uh, again, oncolytic viruses or, or some sort of cancer vaccines, other checkpoint blockade inhibitors perhaps. And then uh, thinking a little harder about the delivery strategies. And so one idea that I'm excited about is just putting in a peptide depot to sort of sustain that stimulation and see if that would result in a, in a better efficacy signal. So with that said, and with a few minutes left, I'm going to uh, switch gears a little bit. But if anyone has questions along the way, by, by all means. So th this is something I've been thinking about for really a, an embarrassingly long period of time, efforts to maximize CD8 quantity. And this initially was born out of a sort of an interest in, in host pathogen interaction. And when I started my lab here, um, it was in the wake of something called the STEP trial. So this, uh, for those unfamiliar, was a large phase 2B efficacy trial for an HIV vaccine that was predicated on the idea of inducing T cell immunity against the virus. So as you know, 99% of the field is focused on trying to generate broadly neutralizing antibodies which is a laudable goal, but a very challenging goal when it comes to, to HIV. So these were three homologous immunizations. The, the major point here, this vaccine was thought to be good based on the magnitude of memory established. And so 76% of individuals had 55 spots per million PBMC. When there were 55 you know, T cells capable of making interferon gamma out of a million uh, in response to HIV. And this was thought to be a very high magnitude relative to, frankly, some very, very poor vaccine vectors. And so the history of vaccinology, uh, particularly in the safety first era, the more recent era, you know, most of our vaccine candidates really don't induce good CD8 T cell immunity, you know, which responds very well to live replicating agents, uh, not so well to things that don't really uh, colonize intracellular components. Um, so, nevertheless, 55 spots per million, 500 spots in the outliers, the people who responded the best. But there was no efficacy signal. It's a little more complicated than that. And post hoc analysis can carve things both ways. There was likely some viral sieving, some, some efficacy here, but clearly uh, not, in, not, not nearly productive enough uh, to, to, to move this forward. And there were some downsides to the vaccination as well. So it's 2007. I didn't know how to do immunohistochemistry, but I was trying to think of what this sort of quantity looked like. And so it's a silly picture here, but if you had a playing field of a million PBMC, pure, t pure lymphocytes, and I were to put an HIV-specific CD8 T cell here, you know, that's what it would look like relative to a larger playing field. So just to get a, a sense of the battlefield. 
But when we're thinking about HIV transmission, we really have to think about the mucosa, which is not made out of, of pure PVMC or certainly not pure lymphocytes. So we have to extrapolate this image, and so you end up with something like this. There's your HIV-specific cell, and in a two-dimensional battlefield, it would look something a little more like this. And so, you know, what I didn't know was, you know, the biology of the cells of the mucosa, how fast are they moving, uh, how fast, if you have a, a rare founder cell, and that's the only good thing about HIV transmission, is that, you know, that barrier function is affected. And so, the number of productive founder cells for productive infection, you know, may be as low as, as one, um, and that's based on, you know, con just uh, concordant couple studies and uh, barcoding and, and monkey experiments. But, you would have to have that CD8 T cell find that cell and do something about it before you had that explosive replication that accompanies this infection. And I was worried that that wasn't enough. In a way, this kind of, these kinds of pictures is what's driven my research program, which I try to understand the biology of the front lines of, of T cells. But without knowing much, the question was, could, could we do better, at least in a sort of theoretical basis? Could we get a, more memory out there at the front lines? And so I'm just going to share with you uh, some work on something called heterologous prime boost, boost vaccination. I don't really want to go into all the details. The point is it's an iterative stimulation. So your T cells are being hit and rested, hit again to expand again, rested and hit again. We're using immunogenic vectors. We're in mice. The idea is that each vector shares something that you want the CD8 T cell to respond to but you package it in a different vector with different outer surface determinants to avoid any you know, interference with, with other immune mechanisms such as neutralizing an antibody. We want to focus the response on the CD8 T cells. And so this is what a prime looks like in a mouse. And this is, this is a pretty potent vector here. It's our effector response, and this is what memory looks like. So 1% one, 1 of our CD8s. If we come along and boost, you get more memory. So you can build on that magnitude. And if you gave a third boost, this is you know, a point back in the day when I think I fell you know, out of my chair in front of the cytometer, but 60% uh, of the CD8 T cells in the blood of these mice are specific for a single peptide MHC determinant that we've driven the response to. And this was true you know, 150 days after that tertiary immunization, about as long as we can go in, in these mice. They only live so long. So that's a lot of cells. That's a, an astonishing quantity. This is a mouse, you know, and so it, you know, it doesn't mean that we can necessarily recapitulate this in human, but I think it does describe what the immune system is capable of. This mouse started with about 200 naive CD8 T cells specific for this pathogen, and this is a polyclonal response looking at the, the endogenous naive T cell pool, which is, you know, rare for this peptide, just like it's rare for, for every peptide. One thing I'll mention is that you know, with each iterative stimulation, you're increasing the number of cells that you would find, like, in a lymph node, but you're sort of proportionally increasing the number of cells that you're going to find throughout the rest of the body. Because it's a mouse, you know, would this translate to primates? Uh, so here, we're basically doing a similar strategy. We're inserting a full-length SIV gag. SIV is simian immunodeficiency virus, and this would be the, the model of HIV that is pursued in primates. In fact, we're, we're doing a lot of vaccine work in primates and looking at uh, whether we can get a, a protective efficacy signal by driving the CD8 compartment much harder. And this has uh, been very provocative work and, and rewarding, but also very long and winding. Uh, but we'll, we'll know within a year how, uh, whether we can confirm previous res results or not. So here you've primed in a monkey. This is uh, just looking at one epitope from the SIV gag that's in the vaccine. You boost, you get more memory of a tertiary, again, you're establishing very, very high frequencies uh, relative to, to other modalities. This is the vaginal mucosa. This would be the site of challenge for these monkeys. Uh, that's the, now the most common site of transmission in humans. And every red dot here is an SIV gag specific CD8 T cell. This is 300 days. This looks long. I should have a way old slide I put in here. Uh, this is about 296 days after that final immunization. And so, uh, 2% of every cell is an SIV gag specific memory CD8 T cell. Not every, not 2% of, of T cells, 2% of cells. So again, primates have the capacity to generate astonishing magnitudes of, of memory uh, out here at these front lines. 
So why are we getting so many memory seeking T cells by exploring this strategy of iterative stimulation? Part of the answer is that we're building better effector responses or bigger effector responses after that restimulation because we had more memory cells. You know, here in the primary, we started with, with only 200 naive T cells. So they had to go through these two, you know, 20 some odd divisions to, to, to create this population. And then most of our cells die. When we stimulate them again, they're starting from a higher point. So the burst size is bigger, but you don't see as much contraction either. And that's an important part of what's going on here. And in fact, when you get to the tertiary, where, where you would only get you know, eight memory cells for every 100 sort of proliferated cells, now you get 50. So what's going on here? This is a busy slide. I'll just kind of verbalize it. But the, the issue with this kind of boosting is that there's sort of a, an axiom in the field that you can't have quantity and preserve T cell quality. And this may come from old experience trying to generate you know, bajillions of T cells to infuse into people that would be specific for tumors. This comes really from a lot of mouse immunology that use tricks of mouse immunology to interrogate what happens when T cells are stimulated. And so the reports are that this invariably results in senescence, cells that can no longer proliferate because you push them too hard, that they are become what we call exhausted, which has a molecular definition, and that they would fail to protect the host, for instance, against viral challenge or would be relevant for, for tumor immunology as well. But again, these are either based on extensive stain, sustained in vitro stimulation or reductionist approaches that for, uh, that for reasons I won't go into, but makes the experiment easier if you're a mouse immunologist. Every time you stimulate them, you reduce the number of cells back down to that kind of naive precursor frequency, which isn't physiologic, but is what's in models. And so that does result in senescence. The fourth time you try to stimulate those cells, they're basically uh, out of gas. And so in exploring why we're getting less contraction, I think we came up with a different view. And this is work uh, that was a former postdoc, Katie Fraser. I could present a lot of slides here. It, it's too long and complicated. I'll give you the, the short and sweet uh, story, and, and hopefully you follow me and believe me. Um, but I'll show you some, some, some interesting data later in just a couple of slides. So the idea is this, that when you start out with 290 cells, and now you have a viral infection. To be numerically relevant, these cells are dividing every six hours. You got to go fast because there's a pathogen. And you're accumulating again these you know, 20, at least 20 cell divisions within a few days if you're a mouse. There's no cell in an adult organism that I know of that can sustain a rate of division every six hours. My understanding is HeLa cells take about 20 hours. So these cells. First of all, they pause. It takes about 30 hours to go that first division because they're increasing their, their cell volume by about six-fold in preparation for this. And I think they're going as fast as they can. So by the time you get to division number 20 you know, at the population level, if you look at mitochondrial mass or, or mitochondrial membrane potential, it's terrible. If you give these cells more antigen and try to, to get them to proliferate more, it's not so good. And in fact, we're losing most of these cells. Most of these cells die. You know, maybe they're not keeping up with DNA repair. Maybe this is important that if you allow a cell to accumulate 20 divisions within five days, you know, to prevent cancer, you just you, you break metabolic speed limits. You don't worry about it. But at the end of the day, that cell is going to be sacrificed. And only a few of our cells you know, live on to fight another day. And perhaps the cells that underwent the, the least amount of stress during this process. And there's a lot of good evidence for that accumulation. When you get to a tertiary response, you have a million brothers and sisters. If you went through 20 divisions and you're a mouse, you would explode because you'd have too many T cells. And the reality is, and we've measured this, they only go undergo about seven divisions. And now, they go through this effector phase, but by a week, they look like a memory cell at sort of a metabolic level. In terms of mitochondrial mass, put them on a seahorse assay, ask them to proliferate again. So it's a very transient window of proliferation. It's not this crazy long sustained proliferation. And so, again, too many words. The point is this. If you iteratively push CD8 T cells through 20 divisions and you do so repeatedly, they become terminally differentiated in senescence. 
And the issue becomes, what if you don't do that? What if you treat them more gently? Yeah, you go through 20 divisions the first time, but then you allow you know, the population in a more physiologic way to proliferate seven times within the window, not 20. Would that prevent this terminal differentiation program? You know, could you have everlasting division potential, or are things like hay flicks you know, uh, going to come into play, or all other kinds of things? That means you can't have magnitudes and, and, and maintain quality. So the trick here is we're not pushing CD8s through 20 divisions every time, and we are resting the cells between each boost. So this would be a quadrant. So we've primed and boosted and boosted. So we have tertiary memory. Now, mouse is getting old. We're going to take a few of those out. So we're going to cheat. This is going to be unphysiologic. We're going to take a few of these cells out, put them in a new mouse, ask them to go again. Could they proliferate again? And so the answer is yes. This is what we've transferred. That's what you can see in blood, those four dots. And then if you were to give them a boost, they go gangbusters through a quadrinary. So the, the simple question was, how long could we keep this going? And I didn't intend for this to last as long as it has. So, so this is 2,500 days ago that we started this experiment here. And quite embarrassing. We're up to the sort of 29th vaccination. Um, what happens? Well, I guess it's old data. It's the 25th. But the population after transfer is still going gangbusters. So we have, you know, these T cells are older than any mouse can ever live. Uh, we have trailing cohorts. This is a repeatable phenomenon. And they have sustained the capacity to divide. These are not cancerous in the sense that if you transfer them and don't give them TCR stimulation, they will just sit there. So you, you have to trigger the cell. And they're not exhausted. They're not exhausted in terms of senescence. If you stimulate them with peptides and ask them to make cytokines, they do. So the whole idea is that this idea that you drive cells to senescence is not an axiom. It's not axiomatic. It depends how you treat the cell. We've sustained cells that are not senescent, not functionally exhausted. We've done the math. I think we're up to at this point of one naive T cell has produced enough you know, memory cells to fill Lake Michigan. Um, and we're, you know, soon we'll be up to Lake Superior. Uh, and, and I think the number of effector cells that have come and gone probably would, would fill the planet. I, we haven't done that math. But we, we've, we've exceeded Hayflick. We've done some measurements there. Um, and the last, the very last thing I'll present very quickly is that there's a lot of cool biology. So I, uh, it's almost become a cell biology project and thinking about immortality and, and you know, maintenance of proliferative capacity. Um, but it's been a useful tool for us to understand memory differentiation by making a, some things obvious that uh, we, we weren't uh, carefully examining things enough to notice along the way without doing this kind of extreme of nature experiment. The one tiny thing I'll show you, which is data that's about a week old, is that these cells, after iterative stimulations, don't, uh, don't look like resident memory cells anymore. They don't have some of these markers. So in a primary, everybody looks like this. In a tertiary, you start to get some cells that don't look like TRM in the gut epithelium. And after, by a 15th an area, they're gone. So we've known that for a long time. We finally did the parabiosis experiment. Are these residents that just don't look like residents, or have we changed the migration rules? We've changed the migration rules. So if you look flow cytometrically, or now we just done RNA-seq, these cells have, have a different migrational machinery on the cell. And if you were to do that parabiosis, here we're looking in the small intestine. In a primary, you have no recirculation. In the tertiary, you're getting some. And in these you know, everlasting boosted cells, they have maintained the capacity to survey the organism more broadly and to go in and out of cells like recently activated effector. So that's my final point there. You know, and there may be some interesting ramifications from an adoptive cell therapy point of view that you know, we could generate a lot of cells that maintain the kinds of qualities we like, uh, even if they may deviate from the phenotypes that you're looking for. And you may even have this overcome this sort of limitation of this phenomenon of residence by allowing these cells broader access to the organism. And so uh, I just want to acknowledge people who did the work. Some former trainees, uh, Katie Fraser and Jason Shankel, were instrumental in terms of uh, generating the nidus of the, the projects I shared. And then uh, the work I shared today uh, really came from Sam Rosado or uh, Andrew Sorens. And thank you.
anyone have questions or comments? Outstanding talk as always, Dave, thanks. So I have a question about the um, the systemic immunity that you can elicit in the in the in the model with B sixteen melanoma when you challenged. Yep. So so your data then would argue that tumor specific cells have then left the site of the tumor, right? Migrated and parked in the tissue that you then subsequently challenged with the tumor. So have you ever looked in the skin of, of mice to see if those tills have actually moved there before you put the tumor in? We, I guess the tumor challenge and you know is is the better experiment. Yep. No, so it's a good question. So one could invoke that as you've said, that you know tumor antigens have been liberated through this process, mm -hmm. we've primed a tumor specific T cell response that has you know, migrated out of the diaspora broadly throughout the organism. And so if you get a tumor challenge, whether it be in the big toe or the other flank, there would be cells on site to right. sort of deal with that challenge. So we haven't in part, because uh, the tools in the B16 that we're using you know, haven't, aren't, aren't outstanding. Um, I, I would like to start looking more at what kind of tumor-specific immunity is established in a more you know, refined sort of yeah. T-cell-specific way. We haven't done much there. I'd love to talk about what you think the, the best approaches mm -hmm. would be. So Dave, I got a question about the last part, you know, where you're saying these cells change their recirculation properties after you go through, you know, 15, 20 plus. Um, yeah. So I'm wondering if you think this is really an intrinsic property that happens after you vaccinate them a number of times, or is it possibly some, perhaps that's something to do with how you're transferring the cells from mouse to mouse in terms of where you're getting them and where you're putting them. Because I'm assuming you're not taking them out of the tissues yeah. and putting them back into tissue, so I would but say, perhaps you can clarify. Exactly. So I'd say yes to both. So I think it, it is important that we're transferring them, in this case from spleen. And we're looking at the potential of systemic immunity. What is the fate through iterative stimulation? And so in a way, a reductionist experiment along those lines. I would speculate, but I do not yet know, that this is a facsimile of things that happen in us. And so in mouse models of, of immunosurveillance, we're really capturing a small fraction because we've been heavily biased towards certain models of infection, either uh, an acute primary infection or certain models of, of persistent infection that, that all have their own sort of issues. The experiment that I can't wait to do is, so, so we just did, got RNA-seq data, sadly, about a, a two weeks ago in this wonderful list of migration molecules that these cells are maintaining. I, I can't wait to look at CMB specific cells where you have this kind of sort of internal systemic boosting going on. These cells we already know have some very weird properties. I want to see if, if, if that's the human correlate with our, our silly everlasting boosts. I can get there. This is more a general TRM question. Um, what controls the magnitude of that alarm that they send out? Can you have the alarm be so severe that you create too big of a of a door for you know you, know, you get uh, uh, vascular leakage or, or, or things that would actually be detrimental to the host? Yeah, it's an interesting question. So I mean, I think you are inducing local inflammation. That is almost the definition of inflammation. If you were to inject an inordinate amount of peptide and you're getting leakage of that peptide and now you're getting sort of, you, you, you might be able to, to generate a more sort of systemic, almost kind of toxic shock cytokine storm, I imagine, if you're coating, you know, vascular endothelium or cells in the spleen inducing, you know, a massive T cell recall if you had enough cells. So I think that would be the, the clinical fear, um, but I think I think that it would be pretty easy to stay below that threshold. Um, you know, when we get into issues of depot effect, that is something that I'm, I want to keep my eye on um, in our mouse studies. But I, I guess you could have um, a secondary infection of a certain kind that could be overwhelming. Well, what I will say is this. So you're inducing an interferon storm through this. So. In fact, if you were to try to infect this tissue with an irrelevant virus, we use Vaccinia, in our case, Tone Schumacher, 
has, has also done this in a, in a very different model uh, in the context of HSV in a mouse. You basically almost have sterilizing immunity. So basically, the, the, every cell has become refractory in our hands to vaccinia replication because those T cells have triggered this, you know, what's referred to as a sensing and alarm function. So I, so I think that the, the opposite might be true, that the, 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 the tissue has been warned that there's a reinfection event and the cells that are responding aren't just the, the dendritic cells, they're the epithelial cells and the fibroblasts as well. So would this be controlled in different tissue sites like the CMS versus the epithelial? Yeah, in terms of the deposition of resident memory. So you and function and response. Yeah. So so you raise a good point. So the field has tended to be every TRM is this sort of homogeneous entity, whether it's in the big toe, the gut, or the brain. And that that is not going to be true. In fact, we know that's not true just from uh, you know looking at the sort of phenotype on the flow cytometer. So the whole concept here, I think, is really these T cells are creating a new home and they have to adapt to a particular microenvironment where the oxygen tension may be different, you know, in the lung versus the gut epithelium, or, you know, what, what metabolites might be available to you. And people just find that, found that TRM in, in the skin epidermis, in fact, uh, have very unique metabolism from the recirculating pool. So I suspect as we learn more as a field that we're going to have to sort of parse things out and think about the larger physiology of, of those sites. So TRM are probably going to be a little different in every in every place. If you looked at telomere length at day 2500 or telomerase activity? We have not. So I've talked to Richard Hodes on a few occasions about doing something uh, earlier on in this process. It's, it's been challenging historically in mice yeah. to do these kinds of studies. I think things have gotten a little better and it's something we should revisit. Uh, we've made token efforts along the way without uh, being particularly successful. I will say that, at least in a primary response, has been shown that, that T cells uh, express telomerase. So, so it may, may or may not be shortening here. Here's the mic. Hi. Um, really interesting talk. Um, so I guess I, one of the questions I was having, if you're going to translate sort of the repeat boosting thing to a clinical setting, I, I presume that most of this, if you're in a tumor setting, that the the stimulation would have to be with intratumoral injections of these peptides rather than, you know, if you're going to stimulate tissue resident yeah, so, cells. And right. so practically speaking, how would that, I mean, I think we've been st starting to do intratumoral injections for a variety of different clinical trials. Um, and so it's been something that I've been thinking a lot about is because I, I do oncolytic virus okay. therapy and we have a trial right now using VSV actually in, uh, in patients, but it's intratumoral, and it's pretty complicated to do it more than once. Yeah. Um, so just wonder what your thoughts would be on that. Yep, so important question. So first of all, being a mouse immunologist and gravitating to the skin because you inject, I, I bypassed all these issues and said, you know, you'll figure it out if, if any of this, you know, it's going to go anywhere. Um, but in, in terms of the repeat injection, I think that is is a potential issue. One uh, that Clark Chen actually has raised in some conversations. So, I, so again, we're testing various depot modalities. We haven't yet, but whether you you put this peptide into either alginate or PLGA, you go in once. The peptide hangs around. Uh, I, I'm hopeful that that might uh, no longer necessitate R2 injections, uh, but we'll. Otherwise, uh, you know, you may want to not want to do this in the GDM or something else for that matter. Okay, let's thank David for an outstanding talk.